and he has a performance scripted. So before we go into our first talk, which is my old friend Nick Waddle, and I'm very fond of Nick, even if he does come to my garden because of the bike and drink most of my alcohol, you're hardly alone in that. I mean, half of all devils in my garden and I drink from most of my alcohol. So before Nick comes on, I'm going to hand you over to Barry Tancaster, all right, and then. Before we start, a couple of announcements for those of you who were not, not here yesterday. <clears throat> the Tunnel of Goats is open for all your rumination laughs. It is situated just outside the front of the conference centre. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the kips and valentines for the kids that were provided by G.E. Johnson have all run out. No more kips and valiners. I'm very sorry. Kids are very greedy. Anyway, on with the show. First speaker today is Nick Waddle. Nick creeps around old people's homes at night and strokes furtively the tartan flasks belonging to the elderly. Today he is asking the question why his prayers to Deputy Dog have gone unanswered. Nick Waddle and his Deputy Dog Federation. Mr. Tadcaster. <clears throat> good morning, well, good afternoon everyone, or well, good morning depends on your perspective and what time of night you went to bed. Uh, my name is Nick and I have prepared um, a, an amalgamation of the research that I've put in place in order to write a book that John will be publishing for me, a uh, young adult's um, child's fantasy fiction about fairies. It's titled The Lost Child of Moss Mollymore and I will read you the prelude with a bit of backing music. You might think that you'd be forgiven for thinking that there are no such things as fairies, but you're wrong. Very wrong. For it depends very much upon whom you choose to say this. Because, as you will very quickly come to realise, there are a great many mixed, mixed views and opinions on fairies. Most people will, of course, dismiss fairies as childish fantasy, idle, idle ramblings. A few may believe, but they have never seen one, and rarest and most special of all. There are those people who actually possess the ability to see fairies, those who are regarded as slightly odd or eccentric. The bizarrely dressed woman standing in a shop doorway muttering strange nonsenses to herself or to a passing stranger, or to perhaps even you. It's my duty to inform you that there are indeed such things as fairies and that they live and walk amongst you. The chances are you've seen one, probably met one, bumped into one, pushed one on a roundabout, even served one in a shop. They look like you, sound like you, and even have different races and creeds. Some are kind and gentle, some are mean, wicked and evil, and they have had wars, many wars. Some have been huge and savage, others minor skirmishes dressed up by politicians for dramatic effect. Our story begins ten human years ago at the climax of the bitterest conflict of them all, the greatest magical war of all time, the Dark Revolution, it is called by historians, a dark fairy sorcerer, Megara Komnasculi, once the trusted aide and confidant of the monarchy had secretly built a great army of goblins, trolls, dark witches and wizards, giants and ogres, all overseen by the worst of his creations, the chaos minions. Few who faced a minion ever lived to tell the tale. Even the name itself had become a taboo. They were commonly referred to as the terrors. 
for fear of bringing one down upon oneself at the merest mention of their name. When the loyalists and monarchy fell, this was to become the way of life for all who lived in the queendom of Moss Mollimore, with all mention and even thought of the times of freedom, of the golden times forbidden. Megara's agents were everywhere. His relentless, solid, iron grip on the people was absolute, and no one dared to think anything other than what the whim of the God Emperor had decreed that day. The people were trapped fossils in the rocks of time. Currently on page 200. John's nagging me like mad for the rest. Fairies, this is the the style that I have gone for in the characters for my novel. Angelic, humanoid, about this tall. And um, fairies have been around for many thousands of years, but no fixed point in time has yet been identified for the true origin of fairy folklore and fairy belief. So what do they look like? Well, some people think they look like this. <laughs> that. That one. There's another one, very rare, that one. And, uh, of course, Farius Hirsuticus Maximus. <laughs> now, they, they date back, um, back into Middle English times, and um, even Latinate uh, references are made to fairies. For instance, the Middle English of fairy will be um, spelled fairy, and it's very similar to later Latinate and French, fairy, 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 still pretty much sounds the same. Feta is the Latin, um, which obviously refers to the fates, uh, lots of Hercules and um, Greek mythology there. And then Vada for the Portuguese, Hada, Spanish, and eventually, fairy became fairy and led to the modern mushy stereotype of three-inch tall wish granting pretty little tinkerbells. Obviously, um, whoops, here we go, back. These are the cotting leaf, remember, these are quite famous, the cotting leaf fake fairies that were all over the news and caused quite a cryptozoological furor. But, um, taken for being real and those who believed in fairies actually believed that these were the real the real McCoy. And it wasn't until later on in the I think it's about in the nineties that it was admitted that they were a complete and total hoax. Um, and there's lots of instances from all over the world. Um, people see them mostly as humanoid in appearance, typically female. Um, Latter-day representation is benevolent, magical creatures. Uh, older folklores, though, however, present a more devious, crafty, uh, demonic um, presentation of, of the fairies. There you go. Lovely <coughs> Disney. Isn't it typical? When Disney gets his hand on something, it totally ruins it. Just in case anyone's going to be scared when they watch it. So, yeah. Tinkerbell here. Now, any of you who've read the original J.M. Barry, Tinkerbell, know that she was a spitting, swearing, violent, aggressive, and jealous feral type who went to no ends in order to arrange for Wendy to be killed. I prefer that one. It's more akin to real life and marriage, I think. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Now, some of the popular origins uh, and causes of fairies. Um, we have the dead. Some people will believe that they are spirits of the dead. Some people will believe that they are fallen angels or demons. And an ancient origin is of conquered races living in hiding. Now, this links, this bit here, this links back to Lars's brilliant talk on trolls. Um, we'll come to this in a minute. So let's look at the dead. Popular ancient beliefs is that they are the souls of the deceased. Their origins are less clear in the folklore, um, being, well, variously dead or some form of demon or some subclass of 
dead people. For instance, the Irish Banshee is considered to be fairyish in origin. Um, if you hear the, the fairy woman, the Banshee, if you hear the scream, you're supposed to die. I haven't heard any Banshees myself, um, but also also known as a ghost, described as a ghost, thus the link with, um, with the dead. Northern English, uh, in the Scots and areas, you've got the called Lad of Hilton, uh, described as a murdered boy, uh, a household sprite, or a bit like a brownie suit. All of these ancient myths and folklores giving rise to all of the amazing um, different varieties of mythical beings, including like dryads, naiads, spirits, tree spirits, um, all of these wonderful sources of inspiration for the likes of Barry, for, for C.S. Lewis, which they've all drawn in. Which is interesting because C.S. Lewis is a very religious Christian author, and yet he had pagan entities within his stories. Um, I find that quite fascinating myself. And of course, those original pagan deities, um, which we're going to look at later, are the um, original sort of beliefs and religions of this country that were demonised by the church when it um, took over. So look at angels and demons now, not the um, Darren Brown rubbish. Again, the angels, angel form there, as you can see, which is the, the form I've chosen for, for my, my novel. Um, they are considered to be like a fallen angel, not pure or wholesome enough to be able to work in heaven, uh, but yeah, not bad enough to be working down in hell. So trapped in between, in, on our world, in a limbo. Not free, but still um, subject to the whim of the devil, if, if you like, his plaything, his tool. Thus, the, um, the, the birth of the belief that fairies are really naughty um, and, and tricky and are out to tangle up your hair or pull your teeth out or cause damage and mayhem within your house. Um, centuries ago, if anything went wrong, oh, fairies, oh, and everyone would take out all of these precautions, these charms, chuck iron around and anything that was considered to be toxic to fairies, like rowan and what have you, and bread. Whereas, ironically, um, there was the belief that fairies would eat bread. So at one point in time, things that are good for them are now bad for them and used as uh, a protection charm. So people's beliefs and, and um, traditions around fairies have chopped and changed a great many times in, in the centuries since. We have another related belief uh, where they are demons entirely, um, which was basically as a result of Puritanism, uh, extreme Christianity, and once upon a time, for instance, the Hulk Goblin, which was considered a friendly household spirit was become a wicked goblin because of the, the religious influences. And if you were found to be dealing with them, you were considered a witch and you would be hung or garroted if you were lucky, rarely burned at the stake. Big myth that everyone thinks, oh, you witch, burn you at the stake. Well, no, it didn't actually always happen. Most of the time they were hung. Not very nice. So there we go, angels and demons. I'll leave that one for you to decide. Origins of fairies, pagans versus Christianity. Yeah, sorry folks, Christmas is cancelled due to pagan copyright. Yeah. If you're a pagan, you will appreciate that. Now, this is paganism, not Wicca. Wicca has only been around since the 1970s, okay? There is a big, big difference, okay? Minor goddesses and spirits, like sprites, nymphs, Tree spirits, the church demonised them um, and relegated them eventually in the 19th century to nothing more than metaphor for love. Uh, for example, um, Cupid is a winged baby is another metaphor or a symbol of a fairy. Um, they were considered a class of demoted angels. Uh, another story is that some angels revolted against God and he went... Oh, you can't come in, go away. And he kicked them all out. And they fell to earth. Where again, they became um, uh, devils and 
demonic caught in that limbo between heaven and hell, stuck here with humans and not able to ever come home and always having to pay a price or a tithe to hell. Now the next belief is that they were conquered races in hiding. So this is where we come back to Lars's talk yesterday. Um, back in the ancient times, when I was young, um, Vikings came over. This is where I met Lars first, um, when he came um, swinging his battle axe and stole my wife away from me. I was living in here, in this little mound under the ground. I was a lot shorter then. I was about this tall. And of course, Lars is about six foot a million. And he came in with his big conquering hordes. And these giant Norsemen would have seen these primitive stone men, Stone Age Neolithic uh, people, running around with uh, the flint spears and primitive weapons. Some would have had bows and arrows, maybe. And of course, you have the advanced Norsemen coming in with their iron and their axes and their swords. And quite naturally, short Stone Age dude would have run in fear, which gave rise to that other folklore that fairies are scared of iron. Iron is deadly to fairies. Well, iron's deadly to anything if you just sort of go and go <laughs> with, a, with a great big sword or lop the head off with an axe. Um, so you can imagine the confusion and the interest amongst the incoming race of these short little people, the little people as they were called, also um, became trolls. Because I imagine you see something like that when you're used to seeing something as gorgeous and handsome as, as, as Lars here, and of course not forgetting the, the rather dashing babe magnet here known as Joe, um, you're going to be pretty confused about what these are. They don't look like you, they don't look like your own people, so therefore they must be people from another place or another world. And as they disappeared down underground, it would have appeared that they were fairy folk or trolls or goblins living underground. So you can see how the ancient roots in, in, um, in history, going back thousands and thousands of years, have given rise through passing on from father to son, mother to daughter, daughter to daughter um, and expanded these myths because anything like that would have been quite interesting and quite exciting and quite attractive and it became an easy thing to blame misfortune and bad, and bad events on. Now there's many, many, many myths worldwide um, about these things. Um, for instance, they've been accused of kidnapping your wives, stealing your children away and replacing them with, uh, with a, a fake child, is, which I'm going to come to that later, okay. Um, and another popular belief, yes, size, form, personality, behaviours, yes, they, they, they change drastically and have been um, thought to exist uh, in many different shapes and forms. So if you look at the, the, the portrayal of them over the centuries, you'll see that they have gone from but ugly and nasty to romantic. The Victorians romanticized them. There we go, see, we have an ancient, romantic, beautiful Renaissance fairy. Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? Whereas originally, they were dark, dirty, filthy, mysterious, and demonic. And now we have got this, a revived interest in them um, there's a, a new film out now which is about fallen angels defending the earth. I can't remember what it's called. I saw the trailer at the cinema. If you want to write a book, the next big thing is going to be angels. Um, so there we have a, a modern representation using um, paint, Photoshop or paint shop or whatever it's called, I would imagine. Um, I got this one off a of DeviantArt. I think some teenager did it. Puts me to shame. But yeah. Ultra modern fairies, but look, if you can see, they are almost battle ready. They are kind of they're not really in fatigues, but they are very aggressive. Although it's romantic and a bit avatar, admittedly, um, there is a certain combativeness. This one's carrying a bow. So, 
Fairies were boys, the sweet little, oh, I grant you a wish, Cinderella, and you can go to the ball. No way. So people used to use iron and rowan to protect themselves and herbs. Another way you could avoid them and contact is by avoiding places that they were known to live. And of course, they were also considered vaguely like wizened old trolls. Now, how do you protect yourself from them? Yes. Whoops, wrong way. You protect yourself, like I said, with four leaf clovers, St. John's wort, wearing your clothing inside out. That was considered a way of protecting yourself from fairies. Um, bread wrapped in bibs or in your baby's clothes, because if you took your baby out at night, there was a risk that the fairies could come and take your baby away. No, don't take my baby. I want your baby. Oh no, it's bread! Ah! Oh, bread! <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. I'm not a very good fairy, am I really? Don't answer that, Richard. No, it's not just in England that we've had the, really, the belief in fairies. Um, Scotland have them, the water horse or kelpies. Um, considered a very dangerous animal often blamed for luring children to their death by tossing its head in its mane in the water going, ha, ah, come and play, you boys and girls. Feel my hair. And as soon as the child touches this water horse, oh, oh no, I can't get my hand off because the skin suddenly turns to glue and you never get away and then it drags you into the water and eats you. That's what Kelpies do. Their mane is covered in seaweed and they are slimy, horrible looking things with a long tail. However, there was once a boy who wisely only put one hand on his friends. Oh, went, oh a lovely campy thing he is. And they got stuck and the campy was making off and he pulled his knife out and went, <laughs> chopped his hand off and got away. But his friends died. I reckon he drowned them and used it as an excuse to get away with murder, but there you go. Now there's other Kelpie type animals. Um, there's Irish ones, Welsh ones, um, Manx, all sorts from all over the world. But I think the worst, most disturbing fairy thing of all is the changelings. Yes, changelings are um, what the fairies replaced your child with when they stole it away. They were good at shape-shifting and looking like your baby. See, this one here is wearing a baby's bonnet. How you could not spot that in your crib, I don't know. Um, unless you've had a but ugly baby from Mars. Mind you, they do look like that when they're born, don't they? So I can see how. Uh, but more later, uh, in telly, um, 19, no, no, 2000 and some or other, um, a series called Supernatural, uh, American. Uh, this, this is a changeling from one of the episodes there. Check those teeth out. Ah, really black eyes. Ooh. Yeah, Supernatural, in case you haven't seen it, is a brilliant series, which would be awesome if the protagonists weren't 12 or didn't look 12. You know what the Americans are like. Yes, so, yes, fairy food is the next thing I want to talk about. If you ever found a fairy burrow or a mound or the entrance to their underground world, oh, it's beautiful in there, twinkling lights, music, little people making merry, drinking, a John's cocktail party, woe betide you if you go into that hole and eat from the fairy's table because you will not come back out. Once eaten of fairy food, you slumber, you sleep, you dream, you live in that realm of the fairies and you will never, ever leave. Just in case you fancied it, don't. <laughs> now another fairy that um, has been well, linked right back to the, uh, obviously, the mischievous, dark, dangerous um, folklore of 
fairies, the tricksters, is the willow of the wisp. Commonly seen in boggy, marshy, wetland areas. Often accused of luring travellers to their doom, doom, doom. There's no air reverb, so I have to do my own. Um, and again, uh, the, the, the will of the wisp crops up in many, many cultures. In America, you've got the jack o' lanterns, um, which suddenly became the headless horseman who carried a, a pumpkin. And that's not will of the wispy, but there you go. But that is the original source of the jack o' lantern mythology. Um, we have the, the will o' the wisp in English folklore, and it has been attempted to be described and um, debunked. A number of times over the last hundred years, uh, the original um, belief is that um, by Alessandro Volta is that it, he, he proposed that it's lightning interacting with marsh gas. However, that was dismissed on the grounds that, uh, well, you know, spontaneous combustion, absence of warmth, uh, and some observed igneous factuae, the, the odd behaviour of these guys receding upon being approached and following you when you walked away, because that's what they did, they appeared to follow you, and then if you went to follow them, they, they led you away, and tried to trick you and sink you into the box and into the marsh. However, a modern um, interpretation is the oxidization of phosphine and diphosphine and, and methane. Uh, these compounds produce are produced by organic decay in bogs and marshes. You get these gases, and as they oxidize, they produce photon emissions, and they ignite on contact with the oxygen in the air. Uh, in any small quantities of it is needed to ignite this, and that could be where the will of the wisp has come from, um, because it's, it doesn't have exactly that extreme an exothermic reaction. And finally, The Tooth Fairy. This, believe it or not, is actually quite a recent invention. Uh, beautiful, pretty, romantic. There's a bag of um, teeth there. Around about the 18th century, um, there's a French fairy tale about La Bonne Petite Souris, the, the good little mouse, who changed its form into a fairy to help uh, a good, beautiful queen. It's funny how in fairy tales those that are good are beautiful and those that are bad are ugly. It was, it decided, yes, I'll help you. Nice to talk like that, in case you're wondering. Um, and um, tricked and tortured and tormented the evil king who she needed to defeat. Um, the, the mouse knocked out his teeth and caused all kinds of menace and thus um, the kind of the first stage of the tooth fairy um, was born. Plus, there's also the ancient belief of witches and how that if they get a part of you, they can control you and, and they have ownership of you. So, when infants and children lost teeth or toenail clippings were, and fingernail clippings were cut, and you know, rather than leave them lying around for any old witch to pick up, because you never know, like witches, you go to wash them. Bad, bad witch. Um, they could get hold of your bits and pieces and have control over you. And once they knew your name, that's it. You could be commanded to do all kinds of nefarious deeds. I used to be controlled by a witch. Not anymore. I'm only joking. I kept all my teeth and I burned them. And I burned all my toenail clippings because that is exactly what you do to get away from the witch from controlling you by having parts of your body. So they did all of this and sometimes they used to keep the teeth secret inside their homes in boxes or out of view or out of sight. And then as time moved on, children were asking, oh, what happened to my teeth? And then it was only a matter of time before people would say, um, the tooth fairy got them? Oh, is that why I've got um, a potato under my pillow? Yes, yes, the, the tooth fairy gave you a potato in return for its, your tooth, because they use them in magic and they eat them. So there you have the, the tooth fairy folklore. And eventually, 
around about um, the turn of the century um, in America, mainly in the US. Um, Tad Tuleja um, wrote about the post war affluence and the child centered culture and media, which gave rise to the tooth fairy. People were given dimes and cents and stuff in, in return for their tooth. And the same thing kind of happened throughout Europe at the same time. So the tooth fairy is pretty much recent and ended up with a three act play in 1927 by Esther Watkins. So there we have one representation of the Tooth Fairy. Here's another one. This is kind of metaphoric for the, the mouse that smashed the teeth out of the sleeping king, only this is a child, and the Tooth Fairy is to say, well, I'm not waiting for the rest of them to fall out. I'm going to have them all myself right now. Thank you very much. So this poor little child is having her teeth smashed out of her gums. I quite like that one. Um, and the, uh, the last Tooth Fairy slide is the one from... I quite like these. These are the tooth fairies out of um, Hellboy 2, the Golden Army, where these tooth fairies actually eat the teeth. Now this is awesome research because people used to feed the teeth of their children to mice or other animals, either to keep them away from the witches. Oh, which is the back? Watch out, there's a witch. Where's the witch? The, oh, there it is. Ah, only joking. I've only just met you last year. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they, they, they hid them and they fed them to mice and other animals. And one of the reasons they fed them to mice is because mice teeth keep growing, they don't fall out. And it was like, oh yes, if we give them the, to the mice, the children will have teeth that will never fall out and they will always be healthy. Um, obviously, yeah, depends on your diet, really, but they didn't know that at the time. So the producers, the researchers for the Golden Army, found this out and thought, hey, let's make this really scary. So the box was opened and hundreds of these guys come out and they started eating everyone. They didn't just stop at the teeth, they just literally ate them. And it was awesome. So I think it's nice to actually see, rather than a pretty wand-weaving, nandy pamby fairy, in the film, I like it when they take it and turn it back onto its original roots and find the link to the original belief and make it the real thing, i.e. evil, twisted, nasty and demonic. So, do I believe in fairies? Of course I bloody do. archaeological digs done um, back way in the 1800s where they discovered primitive burial mounds or burial homes and they found flint heads and arrow heads um, which were known as elf shot. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, my mistake, forgive me for that, but yes, there was something I could have mentioned about that. that there was a lot of linkage with elves and fairies and sprites and, and so on. An elf feature in Moss Monopoly. Right, well, can you hear me? Sorry? <laughs> can you hear me? Eh? <laughs> well, you know what they say makes you deaf. <laughs> what, not enough? I have, um... Uh, I have a normal 
Professional English Medicine. You mean the land of the bogs and the little people probably wouldn't understand. This is a magic stick, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
No, he's going to ask you why the orange jam is called Marmalade. We do actually have real, genuine fairy bones now. Um, there was a legend on the Indonesian island of Flores of a race of hairy goblins called the Igu Gogo, which would make nuisances of themselves by coming out and stealing crops and uh, killing livestock with bamboo spears. And a legend goes that they were all <coughs> invited to a great feast by the, the local tribe of Asian people, who got them drunk on palm wine. When they went back to their caves, blocked the caves up with uh, palm fiber, set fire to it, and smoked them all to death. But a few got away into the jungle and still exist in the deep jungle. So the legend went. And then in 2005, tiny stalls and skeletons were found in a cave uh, on Flores. And they were initially identified as a dwarf uh, island species of Homo erectus. And they were only about 12,000 years old, so they would have been. Um, contemporary with, with human beings on the island. They were, they were about three, three and a half feet tall. And more recent work on the school seems to suggest that they were not uh, a dwarf form of Homo erectus, but they were actually a late surviving astropithecine, which, if this is correct, is utterly mind-blowing. So there you have a legend of, of a race of hairy goblins that are based on real physical things. Yeah. It's easy. You can easily understand how they would be misinterpreted as goblins or trolls because of their short stature, dark skins, and, and what would have been clearly wizened, wrinkled appearances compared to the, the modern Homo erectus who would have seen them. Uh, and such things easily pass on in folklore, don't they, when, when you see these short little people, which is where the little people came from. Yeah, it's amazing. So they're not really fairy bones, are they, or goblins, but... It's an easier target than, than, than going out to hunt. Yeah. And I know I would if I, I'd seen an easier way of making well, we a living. Mm. I think the important thing is to make that distinction between the zoological or cryptozoological side uh, and the science side, as in like these are australopithecines and that fantasy romantic. Um, typical magical creatures, which they weren't magical, but back in those days, I expect these things suddenly popping up could have been misinterpreted and, and accused of being magical deities when actually they weren't, they were just very cunning. Well, the magic, the, the magic and the folklore all, all have a, a trigger somewhere. So mm. No matter how much you draw your years, you can trigger And it also depends on your definition of magic, doesn't it? Mm. Definitely. The way I see it, I don't believe in the hocus pocus. I don't believe in mumbo jumbo. But there's a heck of a lot we don't understand yet. There are a lot of laws of physics which we don't know, but we don't understand. And do I believe in magic? Yes, I do. I think magic is the idiot bastard son of art and science. It's what happens in the end. So, ladies and gentlemen, that seems like a fairly logical place to end. I very much hope that when Nick's book, what's it called? I can never pronounce it. The Lost Child of Moss Mollimore. How am I supposed to remember Lost Mollimore? I can only just remember what day of the week it is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hope the next book, The Lost Child of Moss Mollimore, will be coming out on CSA Press in the fairly near future. Nick's an old friend of mine that I am very fond of, and I'm very glad that he's come here this weekend. He has got a lot of very, very groovy animals, including the sexiest snake I've seen for years. So go to the end room and have a look at his animals. Also, can all the young people, please, the youngsters, and David Curtis, and anybody else who wants to have a go at making monsters out of balloons, apparently there's a monster making balloon workshop starting in the end in the uh, exhibitors room in what should we say, Joe? What should we say, Jesse? Five minutes? 
Okay, Jessica, can you just wave so everybody knows who you are? Look out for Jessica, who does her best to hide her life under a bushel, and she's doing the monster making workshop for the younger generation and any of the older generation that wants to come along. Ladies and gentlemen, there's food for sale, there's beer for sale, or books for sale. If anybody wants yeah. to buy books off me, then, then buy me a beer, that's even better. See you in half an hour. Thank you very much.